Welcome to the Underserved Population Network call today. I'm Misty Kevich with HHQI, and we want to welcome you this afternoon for joining us. Today's call is entitled Reducing Health Disparities Through Organizational Cultural Competence. The handouts for today's session are posted on the HHQI website under the UP tab. Our phone lines are all muted, so we're going to ask for questions to be typed into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, do submit those through the call, and then we'll be stopping for a Q&A session um, after our speaker today presents, and we will address all of the Q&A questions. Um, so once again, we thank you for taking time out today to join us. We're very fortunate today to have a speaker, and her name is I'm going to really probably not do a very good job of this, but Emma Bong, and she goes by MS, um, is Martin, and she is very passionate about serving the needs of the underserved communities, which is why we're on the call today. Um, she has over 10 years of experience in public health research, education, in a variety of arenas, including academia, private, and public sectors, to address disparities in health and health care. Ms. Martin earned her Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry from Brigham Young University, where she conducted laboratory research on unique cancer drug targets. It was during this course of her laboratory research efforts that she realized she wanted to interact with the people behind the pathogens and to personally assist them in improving their health outcomes. She has earned a Master's in Public Health from St. Louis University with an emphasis on behavioral science and health education. Her studies, she also planned and evaluated health programs for chronic and infectious diseases that targeted underserved communities in the inner city of St. Louis, Missouri. She has worked as a community health worker in that region, assisting with diverse, low-income individuals in obtaining public health services, including health care, food, and shelter. Prior to coming to Adventist Healthcare, she combined her background in laboratory sciences and public health as an associate specialist at the Association of Public Health Laboratories, where she assisted the Senior Director of Public Health Programs in coordinating national efforts of public laboratory promotion and program execution. As a highlight of her tenure at that organization, she helped them secure a $16 million five-year cooperative agreement with CMS to fund projects in the United States and several regions throughout the globe. Currently, Ms. Martin serves as the project manager for the Center on Health Disparities at Adventist Healthcare in Rockville, Maryland. She oversees the cultural competency activities of healthcare systems, including managing the project Beat It. And Beat It sta Beat stands for Becoming Empowered Africans through improved treatment of type 2 diabetes, hepatitis B, and HIV AIDS. This program includes educating and training healthcare professionals in patient and family centered practices and evaluating culturally competent care throughout the organization. Additionally, Ms. Martin directs marketing and communication efforts from the Center on Health disparities that leads the development of the center's annual health disparities conference. And Emma is going to be talking about um, her organization, and we're going to get started, but do please write any Q&As into the Q&A box. If you joined us late, the slides are available under the UP tab on the HHQI site. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Martin. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm excited for this opportunity to speak with you. So I'm something of a social butterfly, and so I regret that we can't be face-to-face, -face, but hopefully you'll find that this presentation is engaging and informative, and I'll do my best to keep you alert and attentive during the post-lunch slump for those of us on the eastern half of the U.S. To give you a bit of an overview about the Center on Health Disparities at Adventist Healthcare, the center is about seven years old, and in January we will be, and we're a faith-based nonprofit health system. We have three focus areas of healthcare services, training and education, and a research institute 
to help us fulfill the mission to promote health equity within our facilities and throughout the community. We have several partnerships at both the county level. Adventist Healthcare is based in Montgomery County, Maryland, just outside of DC. And we also have statewide partnerships that help us work towards our mission of improving health equity in the community. Overall, our goal is to promote the health of our communities through the training and education research that we do and the healthcare services that we provide. To speak about cultural competency, often that's a buzzword that we hear and are somewhat nauseated with in healthcare. Um, we know what it is, we hear it, but who does it really apply to? Who does it really affect? And to be honest, the answer is everyone, anyone and everyone who touches the patients, be they physicians, nurses, social workers, home health aides, as well as those who are training to become the physicians, the health aides, and the social workers. Um, what we may find is that often it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. And so if you're already teaching and integrating cultural competency into the curriculum as a student, then that will help you to be the professional that provides the care to the patients. And when we're looking at cultural competency training and measuring cultural competence in providers, we're looking at the knowledge that they're bringing to the table, an understanding of diverse cultures and diverse backgrounds. And if they have the skills and abilities to translate that knowledge into effective patient care. In terms of measures for patients, we want to see that they have improved health status and improved health um, experiences in the healthcare setting, that they have high satisfaction and are pleased with the care they're receiving. Um, similarly, for the, patient, the provider outcomes, we want to see that they are understanding what it means to be a patient-centered care um, practitioner, that their communication is culturally appropriate and culturally sensitive. The next slide just kind of, um, in summary, talks about the research, which albeit is limited, but positive research that illustrates that cultural competency training is an effective and beneficial tool for both the patient and provider, that positive outcomes are seen on both patient and provider sides. And there, while, again, the literature may be limited, there are definitely points in the, it points in the direction that being a culturally competent organization is a positive thing and something that's encouraged. So again, the buzzword of cultural competence is something that we hear a lot in healthcare, but what exactly does it mean? Here at the center, there are two definitions that we really like to use. Um, one is a practitioner or provider level definition. Um, we, as practitioners, want to acknowledge and understand that there is cultural diversity, that people coming through the doors are not all unique. They're not cookie cutter, but they have traditional values, they have cultural beliefs that are going to influence their decision making. And not only do we respect and tol we don't want to just tolerate that, but we want to respect it. We want to value that. And as we value those beliefs, we value those unique um, cultural diversity that each person's bringing to the table, then that's going to affect the way that we communicate with them. Hopefully, as we try to be that type of practitioner, we have an organization that will support that, that supports such behaviors and attitudes and policies to be the organization where we feel comfortable working and comfortable respecting, acknowledging, and understanding the, ch the cultural diversity that each of our patients is bringing to the table. Why is cultural co competence even important? Aside from being a great um, tool to bring patients back to the door, it's mandated. It's mandated in the law. The Affordable Health Care Act makes it such that being a culturally competent organization is something that we need to do. The Joint Commission standards, as well as Title VI, also speak to that. Um, as we know, as many of you may live in very diverse communities, the changing demographics of our nation and our individual communities make it so that we need to be culturally sensitive, that we need to understand and value the diversity that people are bringing to the table, their cultural beliefs, how they impact their health outcomes and their health practices. And as a result, we need to treat them with respect. And so thinking about cultural competence, this big, this small little phrase for a big endeavor, we like to look at HRSA's tool for um, value, domains of cultural competency. About 10 years ago, they the Health Services, Resources and Services Administration developed this tool of seven domains 
and I'll go over them briefly in the next slide, but these seven domains they feel are tools that help you understand and evaluate how culturally competent your organization is. Under organizational values, how committed is your organization to actually providing culturally competent care? Do you have attitudes? Do you have a commitment that is demonstrated in the way people walk, talk, and act at your organization? Under governance, I call this the what. What is your organization actually doing? You say that you're committed to cultural competency, but what are the rules, what are the policies, what are the things in place to actually illustrate that these values exist? Planning, monitoring, and evaluation. This I consider the how. What are the, how are the programs, the processes, the tools that you actually have in place under governance, how are those being implemented? How are those being applied in your organization? Communication. How do you communicate? Does your organization communicate? How do you speak to the members of your staff? Um, if you have a staff that is out and about and doesn't have a lot of access to email, perhaps e-communication is not going to be very effective, whereas there are other ways to reach your staff and make sure that they understand what needs to be, what the rules and the policy changes are, and so what kind of effective communication is available and is it being used to meet the needs of not only your staff, but your patients as they come through the door. Are we communicating with them in ways that are respectful and mindful of their beliefs and their um, cultural values? In terms of staff development, getting back to what we talked about earlier, what I mentioned earlier about um, who needs to be culturally competent, how can they become culturally competent, what are we measuring, what type of training and continuing education exists at your organization, is it encouraged? Are you actually, do you have training, but perhaps maybe because of the timelines and the restrictions on your staff, you don't really want them to go? How does that actually manifest itself in terms of being concerned about um, the cultural competence of your staff? And training doesn't necessarily have to be something that explicitly says diversity training or cultural competence training. It can be training as far as staff-to-staff -staff relations or just patient-centered care, which ultimately also fall under cultural competence, thinking about the definitions we talked about earlier. Organizational infrastructure. What tools, what resources are available to provide culturally competent care? If you need interpreters, are they available? Do we know how to access them? Do we know how to work with them as medical staff in the healthcare setting? Do we have diverse staff available to meet the diverse populations that are coming to, our, to receive care from us? services and interventions. Programs may exist, but are they actually being delivered in a culturally competent manner? Perhaps you have the policies in place, perhaps you have the, the training, but is it being delivered in a way that is going to be, benefit your patients, that's going to benefit your staff and help them to become more culturally competent? And so, considering these seven domains, if all of our T's are crossed and our, dies, our I's are dotted, then if we are able to follow the, the principles of these seven domains, then hopefully we will have an organization that is culturally competent and where patient-centered care is our top priority. And so keeping this in mind, I wanted to provide, well, actually, I'll turn the time over to you all for a polling question. Um, thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I kind of my call dro got dropped earlier. So while you're answering the next polling question, I'm going to go ahead and kind of. I know not everyone got to participate with the first polling question, but I think it really, uh, really uh, takes some of the points that um, that Miss Martin mentioned earlier. Is that that our, uh, that our communities are changing. And for those people that responded, it was resounding, yes, that, that we are seeing changes in our um, diverse population. So if you can please answer this polling question. And once um, this is the one about what is the primary way that your agency addresses language barriers with your non-English speaking patients, if you would submit that. And we'll come back and answer that 
we'll talk about that one a little bit later. So we'll turn it back over to you, Ms. Martin. Certainly. Thank you. So thinking about the seven domains of cultural competence that we follow here at the Center on Health Disparities, the HRSA tool, I wanted to go ahead and provide you with a case example of how we applied those seven domains in evaluating cultural competence at one of the, our entities here at Adventist Healthcare, specifically Adventist Behavioral Health. Um, as I mentioned before, Adventist Healthcare is a nonprofit, a faith-based organization, and we have several entities, including a home health care entity, two acute care hospitals, um, a rehabilitation hospital, and um, Adventist Behavioral Health, which is made up of several different campuses. And so about three years ago, we undertook the task to evaluate the cultural competency of Adventist Behavioral Health, their programs, their staff, their organization. To give you a bit of background about Adventist Behavioral Health, they are a provider of behavioral health services here in our community, here throughout the state of Maryland. They've been around for about 30 years, just over 30 years. They celebrated their 30th anniversary last year. And as Misty mentioned through your polling, we're all seeing diverse communities. We have very diverse communities in terms of race and ethnicity, as well as um, a host of other ways that we define diversity. And specifically at Adventist Behavioral Health, they serve a diverse community as young as 18 months up to a geriatric population with both U.S. born and immigrant born populations. And they serve both public and private insured um, patients. They have acute care services as well as inpatient long-term services, and then partial hospitalization services, which tend to serve and meet the needs of the adolescents, as well as older adults who come in for part-day services and part-day treatment. Between the five campuses, the five Maryland locations, there are over 700 employees, almost 800 employees at Adventist Behavioral Health. To give you an idea of where the different campuses of Adventist Behavioral Health are located, there are are three of them here in Montgomery County where, again, Adventist Healthcare is headquartered. Um, at our, one is located at one of our acute care hospitals, Washington Adventist. The original S. Lori Center is for infants and toddlers. And the ABH Rockville location is the main hospital for behavioral health services. We also have in Anne Arundel County a location that actually at the time was one of our five locations, but since this ed, since this um, evaluation or assessment took place, has split its do, its services between the other three of the other four campuses, and then we also have an Eastern Shore location. So the first phase of the organizational assessment that we did with Adventist Behavioral Health is broken into three parts. The first of those parts was 38 leadership interviews with their executive leadership staff, and the management staff. We then were able to meet and host focus groups with their frontline staff. Um, and we typically had about 10 or 12 people at each focus group, and we held 14 of those focus groups. And then lastly, we sought input from the community and were able to reach out to eight community leaders who interact with ABH on a regular basis, who refer patients or receive referrals from the organization and receive their input on how things are going. So to give you an overview of how the assessment went, over about a three-year period, we broke it into three phases. The first phase, I just gave you an overview of how we collected the data. The second phase was reviewing the data and synthesizing the data. And then lastly, taking that data and placing that into a strategic plan. For the first phase of the of this of the organizational assessment, the data collection, we first sat down with leadership at ABH and specifically met with the president and then met with the president's direct reports, who he calls his president's council, and we presented to them how we would approach this organizational assessment to get their buy-in, to get their support, because not only did we need their support because we would be meeting with them later as leaders, but we also wanted them to trickle down that support to their staff to get them to be supportive of why we were doing this, to understand why these focus groups were happening, that we weren't necessarily coming to call out or put people under the gun, but to get information to help improve everyone's experience, patient and staff alike. So we first met with them and then followed up
for about six months, it took us to get to all five of those campuses throughout the state and meet with the leadership staff over a six-month period in one-on-one -on -one interview settings and get their feedback. We then were able to meet with, based on the feedback we received in the one-on-one -on -one interviews, we met with community partners and had one-on-one -on -one interviews with them as well and asked for their feedback on their perception of how things are running at the Adventist Behavioral Health Hospital. We then were able to conduct the staff focus groups over the summer. We met with them. We set up times to get their feedback as a collective and ask similar questions between the focus groups and the interviews about how the staff-to-staff -staff and patient-to-staff relations, how what their perceptions of those relationships were. To provide you with some sample questions, um, and while based on the audience, be it an interview or a focus group, the gist of the questions remain the same. Obviously, the specific verbiage would change. So we asked, how do you see cultural competence applied in treating your population at your specific institution? Trying to get at how you, after we would define cultural competence for them based on the, the definitions we reviewed earlier, we would ask them this, how do you see this definition applied? Do you see it applied? How does your organization support culturally competent care? Again, most organizations, it's only politically correct to say, of course, we are culturally competent, but how is that really illustrated? What, do you, what are you doing to be a culturally competent organization? And then asking, what do you think is necessary to improve the patient care experience and to improve the overall experience and perception of patient care at ABH? To give you um, some ideas of how this process worked out in terms of data collection, there were over 60 hours of audio recordings between the interviews and the focus groups that we conducted. Again, this is between five campuses and 780 employees. Of course, we didn't get to touch all of these employees in the interview or focus group setting, but a representation of them were captured in 60 hours of audio recordings, five hours of transcription or quali of qualitative text between all of the audio recordings that we got. And that amounted to about 600 pages of transcribed text. We had very busy interns for about three or four months who assisted us in doing that. So it was quite an exhaustive data collection process. In terms of the results and how we organized them, we looked at the strengths that were mentioned. We looked for themes of strengths mentioned between leadership, staff, as well as the community. We looked for opportunities of improvement things that are in place that but perhaps need some more robustness, need some more assistance in being programs that are flourishing and that are thriving and working to make patient-centered care a priority. And then we also segmented the comments we received into recommendations, things that should be in place based on the comments directly or indirectly stated from the staff and the leadership and community. And then, of course, when you have over 60 hours of audio recording, you're going to get some pretty profound statements, some pretty profound feedback about what cultural competence is and how patient care is working. And so we took a section and made some notable quotes, as we called it, and placed them into the report. And just to kind of give you uh, an overview of how we took and formatted the report, because again, this was a lot of information and definitely needed a handle to make sure that it was concisely and um, clearly understood, we took under each domain, we asked questions that fell within the seven domains. And within those domains, as we took the feedback, as we reviewed it, we put it into different sections based on the strengths, opportunities for improvement, recommendations, and then we took the perceptions based on the one-on-one -on -one interviews with leadership, the staff perceptions based on the focus groups, and then the community perception, and segmented within each of the HRSA domains the categories of strengths, the categories for improvement, and the recommendations. And that's how we outlined the, the final report. So in summarizing and taking all of that information, it took about three months of um, intensive focus on taking all of that data, taking all of the transcribed text, and category, categorizing it, as I previously noted on the slide before, that we took it into the different segments, different categories, and placed it accordingly. We then presented that report, the final report, to the president and to his reports, his president's council. And then we presented it to the leadership, the management leadership, 
that to get their input, to get their feedback, so they know how their interviews, how their sacrifice of time played into the final report, what we gained from the experience of speaking with them and their staff. Then we met with leadership and we outlined a strategic planning process. Based on the recommendations, the opportunities for improvement, we allowed them to do the driving and we kind of sat in the passenger seat and helped as necessary and help them outline what a, an appropriate strategic planning process would be, how to carry out some of the recommendations, what prioritizes, what priorities they felt needed to be um, in place based on the recommendations and the opportunities for improvement. We then, through their own um, request, assembled a task force to focus on, these, on the strategic planning process, and we met with them for about six months about four months actually, um, and help them to develop the plan, to improve the areas for improvement, to just come up with ways to say, now that we have this feedback, now that we've taken this information and synthesized it and developed our priorities, how are we going to carry it out? And it was a powerful thing to have members of the task force coming from the staff to come to the table and determine based on not just their feedback, but feeling that they were integral to the process from day one, that these are things that they see on the ground floor, things that they felt were important in their personal um, points of care, taking that information and saying, yes, these are the priorities, I see them, I deal with them because I'm a frontline staff person, and having them develop the strategic plan was a very powerful process and one which they all seem to appreciate. We had about 12 members of frontline staff representing the four campuses, and gave, they gave their input on a monthly basis over a two-hour period to develop the strategic plan. And then lastly, we took that plan and we presented it back to President's Council, back to the President and his direct reports. And again, just to give uh, credence to a touchy-feely moment, we allowed the task force members to actually present the information. And again, a powerful moment because they were able to take true ownership of this, of this organizational assessment. It wasn't necessarily the center coming in and saying, here are some places you can improve, finger wagging, these are things that are bad, you're a horrible organization, let's start from the ground up. But it was really them from the process saying, here are some places we need to improve, and I see that. I've seen that in my patient care environment. I've seen that in the way I interact with my staff, and I'm excited to take this and find ways to implement a plan to really move forward, to really make some changes. And so by them owning it, we get to kind of be in the driver's seat or maybe even really in the back seat as they guide the course of how things move and how their, their organization gets to evolve and become more culturally competent. The last phase, um, if we can call it, that is really a fluid phase in that it's an ongoing technical support to the executive leadership team and to the staff. Again, as I mentioned, we really allowed them to drive this. We definitely got into the process. We collected the data. We did our part and we did the groundwork and got in there and got the feedback that they needed. But at the end of the day, an organization really has to take ownership and really has to say that this is something that's a priority and this is something that we're going to make changes. We're going to make sure that we become the organization that we want to be. And so our role then becomes a supportive cheerleading role more than anything. And so just to give you a few highlights about what we've been able to do as we cheered them along in their process to becoming more culturally competent, um, several springs ago, we were able to have a cross-cultural communication training for their staff, specifically some bilingual staff work. They voiced in one of our focus groups the need to feel more integrated, the need to feel like they were more a part of the process, a part of the culture and the, the staff family of the, of the organization. And so we had a training where we were able to teach both the bilingual staff as well as their non-bilingual peers about ways to be more effective, more respectful in training um, in, in communicating with one another. Uh, this fall, we as an organization have a partnership with ABH, with Adventist Behavioral Health, to plan our annual conference, which is focused on reducing disparities in behavioral health. 
And so we have since May been working very closely with the president of, of Adventist Behavioral Health to plan this year's conference. And he's been a great support, as has the organization, in providing us with feedback, suggestions, and just helping form the agenda. And so while this may be, it falls under the umbrella of the Center on Health Disparities Annual Conference, it really is promoting the values and the the beliefs and the what ABH is trying to achieve in being a culturally competent organization. And so they're definitely helping us make this year's conference and helping make their organization more culturally competent through their participation, their planning participation in this year's meeting. This fall, in fact, next month, we will have a Train the Trainer on culturally competent care and specifically around um, spirituality and behavioral health. Several weeks ago, it came to our attention through a, me a former member of the task force that we worked with that there were some challenges with staff and patient to, st patient to or staff to patient, rather, communication when it came to spirituality and that they wanted to have a training to help them understand how to better navigate some of the nuances that they've been encountering. And so as a result, we will be putting forth a training where we'll meet with their management and leadership teams and train them on how to go back to their units, their departments, on how to be more culturally sensitive, more um, communicative in a diverse, in a culturally appropriate manner with each other and with their patients around spirituality. And then in terms of an ongoing achievement, we are working with them intensively to improve their bilingual and linguistic services through bilingual staff training and contracted interpreter services. So again, while we are definitely in the background with ABH, at the end of the day, them becoming a better organization, a more culturally competent organization is something that we are letting them take the wheel on, we're letting them drive, and we're just playing supportive roles. But they've been able to do great things through our, through our support and through their driving. And just as a final plug for this center, just to let you know about some of the other great things we're doing, I encourage you to visit our website where we have our annual reports that speak about things along the lines of cultural competency and ways that we're improving our different entities within Adventist Healthcare. Uh, we specifically are in the process of having an annual health equity report that speaks to what our entities are doing to improve the health of our communities. And so that's something I'd encourage you to visit our website and check out, as well as our Facebook page, which we often report um, great information about what we're doing in the community, but also um, highlights about ways to improve culturally competent care, ways to improve the face of your organization and to be a better provider and provide better patient-centered care. We also have a monthly e-newsletter that I encourage you to subscribe to where we highlight um, a number of great initiatives such as culturally competent care or um, our annual conference and other things along the lines, not just our information, but your information as well. If you contact us and there's something that you feel that is relevant that you'd like to highlight, we definitely encourage that and we place that, place that in our news you can use section and try to keep an engaging conversation open because it's not just cultural competence doesn't just stop at your organization, but it's really something that can trickle down into your community. That's what we want it to do. That's what we all hope will happen. And so with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll turn the time back over to Misty. Thank you so much, Anna. That was wonderful. Um, I do want to let you know to please send in your Q&As on the Q&A tab. And while we're waiting for that, I'm going to highlight a few things that Emma said that I think are relevant and I want you to start thinking about from your organization. Um, I'll, I'll start first with um, talking about, in general, we, we talked about, the, you know, the cultural changing and what we need to do. And in home health, we have to meet the needs of all of our, our, of our patients and our families and our communities. And there are many agencies, and your agency might be one of those, but many agencies that we work with or have spoken with across the country are really still just at the very early stages of working on um, organizational co um, cultural competency. Some agencies might have an annual training, and that's that's kind of where they are. And actually, I have 
the slides. So I'm actually going to move the slides while um, we while you're sending in questions, and we see some coming in. But I'm going to go back to earlier in the presentation from. Let me get to your. Sorry, bear with me. So I get. I didn't think about this till as we you were progressing, MS. But I thought this the slide and looking at the seven domains was it was extremely telling of for many home health agencies and I'm sure many healthcare organizations and and MS I'll ask you for your feedback too. But I think from an organizational value as leaders, and many of you are leaders on this call, you understand that. You you understand the importance. You may have you may have already updated your policies and, and procedures. You may have implemented different pieces under the governance and even the planning and monitoring perhaps, but it is very difficult to continue down through this, uh, this reverse pyramid and getting it to the staff level and making sure that it sticks and it becomes their own. And, and I think, uh, MS, I think one of the things that you talked about your project, because you took, it was very painstakingly perhaps, but it was very um, specific in your development and that you did involve focus groups and you did involve uh, providers so that you had that aha moment or that powerful moment you spoke about where they actually took ownership. And that's really where you're go the rubber's going to meet the road to be able to take those policies and those ideas from leadership and get that out there. Um, comments, MS, that you might have related to that? Yes, thank you for pointing that out. I, I absolutely agree with you. It really is about having that aha moment because if they're not engaged, if, they're, if they don't have ownership, the rubber is not going to meet the road, you'll be – it, it will be more painstaking. And in fact, beyond being painstaking, it will it will be halted. You won't be able to progress until they can understand why, and they can understand how. And that understanding that that why and how is not going to be the center. It's not going to be from the the perspective of the leadership, but it's really going to come from the grassroots. It's going to come from the bottom up. It's going to come from them putting putting forth the effort and bringing things to fruition through the painstaking activity, activities of being trained, of reevaluating where they stand and realizing that maybe there's some things that need to change. And I think that's a hard thing. No one wants to hear that they're not perfect, heaven forbid. But once you acknowledge, going back to the, um, the definition of cultural competence from the practitioner level, once you acknowledge that there are some challenges, once you acknowledge that there are differences and that you have some room to grow, that's when true learning and true change begins. And having them buy in from the beginning, having the leadership support it, and then having the staff be a part of it was really, really helpful to get the aha moments to happen and have the rubber meet the road. So I definitely coincide with what you say. I definitely agree with that. Great. Well, we have a great question here from Carmen. What was the biggest stumbling block to gaining substantive change and improvement in cultural competence? Was it financial? That's a good question. You know, interestingly enough, finances were not the main stumbling block. Um, one of the things that we found with this organization is that as we looked at some of the recommendations, some of the opportunities for improvement, there were things that were already preverbal, if you will. They were already on their minds, already thinking about it. They just perhaps hadn't taken the steps to get there. And so it was already in the process, already in the works, and so somewhat already budgeted for. But interestingly enough, something that I think an aha moment for me, if you will, is that I realized is that a lot of these things are not, not really cost prohibitive. A lot of the changes are really going to come from within, changing the way we think, the way we interact, the way that we treat one another. Because what, uh, a saying that we often have is that you can't give what you don't have. And so if I'm not being treated well as a staff member, if I'm not being treated in a manner that's respectful of me and my values, I can't turn around and give that to my patients. And so a lot of the changes that we found, and perhaps this is organization specific, but I'd, I'd like to believe that it's not. A lot of the changes are those 
those intangibles, not the things that you take to the bank, but the things that you take to the heart, that you take to the mind and really try to change people and not just an encounter, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And I do think that there's actually, on that same note, the more culturally competent you are, you're actually going to see some financial rewards between, right now we're not being reimbursed for age caps, but um, health care referrals may be using your age cap scores um, into deciding where they're going to be providing um, or, or sending referrals, but also that satisfa- patient satisfaction and getting repeat referrals and word of mouth. All, everyone on this phone knows that a negative word of mouth um, a patient episode is really going to be very hurtful. So we could actually gain, you can create a somewhat of a business case in what you may be able to get in return um, positively after um, really spending some time with um, creating a, a better culture in your in your agency. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. I think more than just even the reimbursement piece, which, as you mentioned, is a work in progress right now, it's more about the patient piece. If I leave and I have a horrible experience, everyone's going to hear about it. If I leave and have a great experience, everyone's going to hear about it. And they will come back and they'll bring their family and they'll bring their friends. And so it's really about the patient experience being positive, and that is really, that's really where the payment payoff comes in. And we're all focused on providing quality care for patient-centered care um, re- related to the patients. And yesterday I was on a, uh, on a webinar. It was the Hospitals in Pursuit of Excellent call, and they were talking from a hospital perspective, and some of you may be from um, health systems that are on the call. And small home health agencies don't give up. I have lots of, we have lots of resources that will really be beneficial to everyone, but some, some real good ideas for small agencies too, but hang tight. But for, um, from the hospital perspective, what, they, what their focus uh, of the presenter, I believe it was from Mass General who was the presenter, is that they did patient satisfaction uh, beyond the age cap. And they, the patients that received um, culturally diverse patient education materials, they had, a, um, they had an interpreter, that they tried to meet the cultural needs of that patient with a huge significant difference in the patient satisfaction. And it really didn't take a lot of effort. It took a consistent process in setting up the the systems and also the education, um, and it really was a big payoff in the end for improving the level of patient care that was perceived by the patients and families. Absolutely, and that's something we found as well, um, not even necessarily with interpreters, but just in the basic onboarding experience and the the initial check-in. If you felt that someone was respectful, they noticed that you're wearing a religious symbol and they acknowledged that and said, what can we do in terms of your stay to make this a more comfortable stay for you? How can we adapt your menu? How can we make sure that you have a place to meditate? Or what needs do you have? Just those little things cost nothing, cost absolutely nothing, but a little bit of time and an observation. And that's where, again, the rubber really meets the road in terms of culturally competent care. It's not necessarily the big things, but they, they're big things to someone, and that's what, that's what matters. And, and, and kind of, it, this is for any agency too. We have a lot of pieces in the underserved population, and I'm going to talk about um, resources here in just a few minutes. But there are even tips on how do you, be, you know, how do you start to work on that? And we'll, we'll give you a checklist. And I know Mary May Ryan is on this call, so we're going to be sharing lots of her resources. Um, she is a guru in this area, and that was very helpful with the underserved population BPIP. But there are tips in there in the in that section of the best practice package of creating focus groups or inviting a patient that is, has a different cultural or ethnic background to a staff meeting and have them talk about it. It doesn't have to be a patient. It could be someone from the community to really get an understanding. If you invite a speaker for 10 minutes, to, you know, 15 minutes at every one of your staff meetings or somebody, um, that is going to really provide you more insight. But one of the um, interventions that uh, 
MS that your agency did is actually recommended by the IOM is really to start looking for, when you're hiring, looking for bilingual um, employees. I mean, you're going to be looking at skill levels, but it is really important in today's age to start looking at linguistics um, and really helping to pad what you have internally. You know, it is different when you're able to have somebody go out that is a face-to-face -face versus just using a phone service. But also, that person, if you hire them, utilize them as part of your patient edu or your staff education. I mean, they can create great value um, to your organization or be part of that the, uh, work group in, in setting up your practices. Absolutely. One of the things that we do here at Adventist Healthcare is take our bilingual staff, um, we test and assess how um, competent and coherent they are with both the language of service as well as English, and then we assess whether they are level one, able to do um, basic interpreting for basic directions, basic customer service, or level two, and that's more medical interpreting, medical setting information. And we take them, and as you said, we it's a value-added piece. It's value added for us as an organization to be able to just pull from our resources within and use them to interpret. But it's also value added for that staff member to know that, oh, growing up and learning Russian wasn't just a waste of my time or not an embarrassing thing, but it's actually a value added. I actually bring something more to this organization than just blood pressures or finger sticks, but I actually can make a patient encounter a lot more favorable, a lot more comfortable. So it's definitely a symbiotic blessing to have bilingual staff and to utilize them. Great. And I also think you know, you're getting passion underlying, too, <laughs> absolutely. And, and our third polling question kind of ties into what we're discussing right now is what is the primary way, and obviously you could only do one answer, that your agency addresses language barriers with non-English speaking patients. The majority of those that answered said contracted interpreter services. I mean, it's very, you know, you're not able to do that for all the languages that you provide, or especially if you live in rural areas. Um, and also, in the, and believe it or not, of those that responded, we had 23% that said bilingual staff. So that, um, but it is really using a variety to be able to meet the needs. So um, very good. Well, before any more questions, please have them come in, and I don't see any yet at this point. And I'm going to move to some resources, but MS, you stay on because we may get some more, and we Absolutely. may have some more comments as we go through a few resources for everybody. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, there we go. There are in the underserved population best practice package, it was a huge package, there are a lot of resources. And so we try to highlight some of the resources there or elsewhere that really relate to our specific topic and for today it's cultural competency. So there is sections in this best practice package on page 30 to 38, plus there are tools that are on HHQI. There are more tools than I'm going to talk about or show you on slides, but I picked the key ones to, to make sure that I could show you. Now you're on this next slide, this is the basic cultural um, assessment checklist. Now you're not going to be able to see all the details here, but this is just a, it is a guide of some of the key items that you need to do as an organization. You obviously are, are, have to build this, just like MS had talked about. They start it, they continue to add, and if you look, remember her la one of her last slides of where they are in the process, they're still in that continual continuality of adding and reevaluating where they are. So it is a continuous process and we're all used to doing quality improvement and it is continually getting that feedback and changing. So what we did is provided you just a basic checklist for you to get started. You may have one or two of these items already. You might have six or seven of these already in your organization, but it's a great resource to look at to say, well, we don't have anything related to that. Let me see. And there are lots and lots of links within the, in this document to get you to resources to help you in that area. It's not saying you need to have everything, but these are key and very important for you to think about. You can't add them all at once, but you can build them into your plan. The next resource 
is a cultural <clears throat> a sensitive assessment. <clears throat> this was created, sorry, <clears throat> this was created for us by Mary Narayan, and it talks about different cultures and um, about what you need to think about for assessment. And then it relates to medication, to pain, um, and it breaks down our systems and our processes that we need to do, and it gives you some really good points. There are seven pages to this. This is an, an excellent resource. So it is under our, you know, with the underserved pop, sorry, it is under education. All these resources are under education. And then if you click on um, the BPIP and go to the underserved um, population BPIP, you can get the whole document. If you've never downloaded the whole package, please do. There's, it is a, a resource for you to use. It is something that you'll, there are tons of links, so definitely keep it electronic. If you've, and some people have found it very beneficial to print it and to be able to, to earmark it with tabs. But um, also, there are though a lot of things that are talked about in the package. Not everything is it is provided to you separately. So this is in a Word document. It's easy to pull off. It may just be great education to use for staff, meaning that you might add um, and, can, and you may even want to um, provide to all. You would want to provide to all your staff. The next um, document is the basic cultural. Oh, I went the wrong way. I think. Sorry. I did. The next, the next resource is the I Speak cards, and actually, this was created for our, um, for to use for the, um, for the national. Not my my mind has gone this afternoon. Can't think what. Anyway, it is it is three pages, and it has the, it is the phrase that says, "Mark this box if you read or speak English, um, or speak." Japanese or Arabic, and there are 38 different languages on this sheet. So if you're in a very diverse population, and especially if I'm, I, I am not bilingual, this would be a good resource for me to have available that if I got to a patient that I'm having trouble and had no heads up on the intake, then at least I could identify what language we need, I need to deal with, and then I could use the telephone interpreter to work through um, and, then, and create a care planning around that. But that at least gets you into which language the person speaks. Um, the interpret tool is another tool that uh, Mary Narayan shared with us, and this is from the Think Cultural Health, which is an excellent resource. Um, but it's, it's a really good tool in how to work with interpreters. And if you've not worked with interpreters, it, it can be very difficult. But or cumbersome to start with. But here's some really good tips about how to work with an interpreter. And that's also available for you. And as well as the working with an interpreter sheet. And this is also for, um, boy, I'm changing slides, but um, this is, there we go, sorry. It, this is a second tool. Sorry, my slides um, went a little faster than I thought. Working with an interpreter is the roles of the interpreter and how to do the three-way uh, discussion with the patient in the interpreter. So, again, there are some really good resources. Um, and as our communities change, more and more clinicians are going to need to use interpreters. So this is a, uh, these are great tools and resources. Now, we have the national class standards that are recommended nationally. Many states have already adopted or are in the process of adopting um, the class standards even for their medic medical assistance patients. But there is the blueprint which has a chapter for each of the 15 standards that is available on Think Culture. You just have to sign up to get the information. And we also have information in the underserved best practice package, and the pages are provided as well as in the August update, our monthly newsletter, we gave you an update with the revised class standards and some tips included into our newsletter. So there are some resources for you there related to the class standards. Um, I must have missed one. There, there is an. I must have missed one of my slides. Interviewing st strategies for cultural assessment, and this was a tool that Mary Narayan also developed for us, and it's great. It is a. I'm not sure how many pages here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Because I even printed it off because I wanted to to tell you a little bit about what it is. Let me see if I can find this slide for you. Um, Oh, 
well, I'm not real sure where I put the slide, but I had one. Um, but it talks. There is. In, these are interview strategies. This is. Uh, this is a great tool, and I'll repeat it for you. It's called Interview Strategies for Cultural Assessment, and it's listed with the um, HHQI resources. But it provides you as a manager or you as a leader in questions to talk to your staff about, or at least that's a, a good way how I would use this tool. And it, and it, it gives you a chance to have dialogue, like how important are cultural customs to you, so that you can explore your own um, cultural diversity and your own cultural meaning to yourself, and which customs are important to you, and how can we help with these practices. I think it could be used at a clinician level initially, but then the tool is designed that you can use this with your patients and your families as well. But it talks about religion and spiritual beliefs, language and literacy. Um, it talks about nonverbal communication uh, and things like how would you like our staff to address you. And if, if we're not knowledgeable of their cultural uh, uh, specifics, you know, we could at least ask and find out from that patient or their um, caregivers. But it also talks about health, illness, and framework, and it goes on, medication assessment, and it's an excellent tool as well. So if, if, if you have any additional questions, please send them in. But there are a lot of great resources that are available here uh, for you. And in the meantime, I'm just going to kind of give you a heads up on our next Up Network um, webinar. In November, we are only going to have one. It will be November the 13th, and I think this is, even though it may, you may think it's for small home health agencies, it is not. It is for any home health agency. Um, it's advice and tips from home health experts on three topics. Um, so here's some three questions to think about, and that will kind of tell you this is for you. Are you in charge of your PI and QI program and you have a, a lot of other things to do? Do you know what the essentials are? If you're a, you know, a small agency or a medium agency, you might have, you wear many hats and you're not even sure or you're new to quality improvement. Where do you even begin? So we're going to have um, a speaker talk specifically on that, the key things that you should be doing with your PI and QI program. We're going to, uh, the next little bullet is, does your pulse race when it comes time for a survey, any type of survey, your Medicare survey, your joint commission, or your CHAP survey? Uh, we're going to have a speaker that is going to talk about how to survive surveys and how to, be, to get your organization prepared for any type of survey. And then do you have palpitations when your mail is delivered with the ADR? We've seen an increased rise in um, ADR. So, um, for, for any size agency, what can you do to prevent that? And then as well as how do you go about appealing those successfully? Our three speakers are consultants. We have Cheryl Pastella, and she's the owner of CAP Consulting, LLC. And Nancy Allen, she's the founder of um, and CEO of Solutions for Care, Inc. And Barbara Piscor, she's the owner of B BKP, Healthcare Resources, and they both will be presenting for about 10 to 15 minutes on their topic, Gary. We'll entertain lots of Q&As, and they'll be open for your questions, um, you know, in a, even above those. But I think those are three big topics we're going to have a lot of questions and great dialogue about. So keep that in mind. That is for our November call. Do watch. We really value your feedback as home health agencies in reading the best practice packages. Each and every package that we develop, we take comments from an assessment that we ask people that have downloaded the package to provide us. And we're getting ready, uh, right currently, the medication management uh, that focused BPIP assessment is out. But the immunization infection control BPIP assessment is going to be going out November 1st. It really, it says 10 minutes, it'll take you less than five minutes to do that. But we take that information and it really helps us design the next best practice package. What is it that we really, what are you using? What didn't you use? How could we make it better? So we value every single comment, but in every, uh, um, every single answer that you provide. It will just take you a minute or two. We do have a recognition certificate that you can print off and put in your agency and you can pub publicize helping us out. The next live chat, if you've not taken advantage of those, there is no audio. It's just 
putting questions in and we answer, try to provide resources. So we had one last Friday. It was excellent. We talked about disease management, patient self-management, -man and fall prevention, three big topics. We had great dialogue, great sharing of resources. So um, and if you missed it, there is a follow. You can find um, and, and see the feed of that on um, under networking, I believe, under live chat. Um, actually, I, think I do have that on the slide here. But you can register for just a reminder notice, and that I gave you the link here. It's just an hour, but it is very valuable. You can ask questions on whatever topic, and if we, one of our team can't answer it, you know, we answer a lot of data questions that you might have. Uh, we answer not just our data, but we'll try to provide you insight to the CMS outcome data, whatever it might be. Whatever comes up, we, we handle that for you. I don't see any other questions that have come in. Um, and oh, let's see. You will be redirected to the live chat page after the webinar. Thank you, Misty D. And there will be a survey also afterwards, just a simple evaluation just to give us some feedback from our up calls. Um, and if you have any suggestions of what topics you'd like to hear, we're working on our 2014 agenda. And MS, would you like any to have any last comments from you? Ah, that's a great question. <laughs> I'm going to say patience, patience, patience. Cultural competency has just, it seems like it's kind of exploded on the map for us here in healthcare, but it's its really going to take some time to really get everyone on, on board because while it seems new to many, it really has been around for several decades. It's become more of a relevant and a hotter topic in the last few years, but it's going to take time. It's going to take time for everyone to get on board with you and for you to get on board and make changes as well. So we all have to just be patient with one another, I think is probably the take-home message. Oh, and that's, that's Thank you so much. That was great vi wisdom because we don't want you to be overwhelmed. This is something that you are you, we're trying to work on, and you start adding. So thank you so much, Emma. That was a great closing point. And again, we thank everyone that attended, and we hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon.